I, I like to think about Miranda Harcourt. I had this great tip for me and she said, when you read a character description for an audition, it'll always say like, this is a handsome, charming man who's a lady killer and is uh, beautiful. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they're just writing it for you. So why, why, do we, why do we audition for those ones? <laughs> Basically, when I read a character description like that, like, this guy is so smooth, I'm like, what the hell, I'm not smooth. I'm like a thin, weedy little man from Fangarela. I can't play this guy. And she was saying, uh, an another way to think of that is, what do you think that person's biggest fear is? What do they fear? And so if someone's smooth and charming, they probably fear awkwardness or they fear being disliked or they have a fear of being left out of a group or they have a fear of people thinking of them as weak. And generally, those fears are, uh, can be a nice way to get to get into like, oh, yeah, I kind of have a fear of being thought of as weak. And so what do I do when I'm confronted with that situation? Do I, do I get tough with someone? Do I try and act staunch or do I back away? Or I often find it hard trying to create a character and rely a lot on directors to give me, to give me some sort of direction in, in which to push the character. What the hell? Where have you been all day? Xander is pissed. Yeah, I'm in some trouble, man. I think I'm being tracked. What the hell was it like working with Daniel Radcliffe on Guns Akimbo? Oh, big boy, Danny. Oi, oi. Daniel Radcliffe, the nicest young man in show business. Seriously, though, I was so nervous, very excited, very nervous. Well, basically, I was also starstruck with her because she's Hugo Weaving's niece. And so I was like, oh, my God. I'm like psyched about Radcliffe, also psyched about Hugo. I was like a fanboy. And so they both popped in when I was like getting like a haircut for the role. And I was so nervous and I, I, I was just, uh, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a comedian who says, whoever tells you they can act normal around famous people is lying to you. It's like, it's like when a cop comes, you can pretend you're acting normal, but it's like when you're driving next to a police car, you're just like, oh, hello, sir. Yes, here are my hands, 10 and 2, just going the speed limit, no big deal. You're, it's immediately you're aware of everything you do. You don't want to be weird. You don't want to be a creep. When I first met Dan Radcliffe, I was like, oh, hello. Very pleased with you. Hello. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Great one, Danny. <laughs> and I really, <laughs> I really, really wanted him to like me. I wanted him to like me so badly. So much so. Okay, this is a story about Danny Reckler. This is an embarrassing story. So we were chatting and I was so, I was like, Man, come on, me and Dan are going to be pals. I'm going to show them around my city. Let's go. And so anytime there was this poor Daniel, anytime there was a spare moment on set, I was like, oh, hey, what, what are you reading? He's like, oh, and we got chatting about books because I noticed he was reading. It. Yeah, me and Danny chatting about books. And uh, uh, so I was trying to chat with him. And then he was talking about a book that he read. It was like an uh, economics book. And he was saying how interesting it was. He talked about the global financial crisis. He was talking to me and we were walking and we had just got, we just got like something to eat. And then we were walking back to like his, like, he had a room that him and his mind would go and like learn lines and he could have a place where he could chill out. And he was like walking back into there. And I was like, oh, he's telling me about this book. I'll, I'll just follow him in because obviously it's a conversation that we're having that we, is going to continue. And so he was like, yeah, it's about global financial crisis. And it's written by someone called, and he was like telling me the author's name. And he was like, yeah, it's really good. I was like, oh, yeah. And then he walked into his room. And for him, that was the end of the conversation. And I thought, oh, we're going to have some more chat. <laughs> so I kind of walked in there and his mind like looked at me. And then he, he, he had like turned around and was like putting something down and he turned around and it was so awkward. He was just like, oh, oh, it was, sorry. And I was like, oh no. Anyway, but get out, we got more film we needed. It was so embarrassing. I was like this weird, creepy stalker man. To his credit, he was so lovely. He would do things like there would be someone who had only been on set for like one day, like no speaking, like a non-speaking role. And literally, he, Daniel would find him and be like, hey, I just want to say thank you so much, man. Like, I saw some of the stuff that you did the other day, and I think it's going to really add to the film. So I just want to thank you for coming on. Yeah, it's really a pleasure. And, like, it, it, he was unbelievably nice. And you really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Everybody was just like, Daniel's the man. He is the man. Yeah, I don't have enough good words to say about the guy. So you keep in regular contact with him now? Yeah, me and Dan, I'm always <laughs> asking about his books, following him into rooms that he doesn't want me to follow him into. We're good buds. We're good buds. Yeah, no, I definitely understand the whole, you know, uh, when you're working with someone that you consider famous and just trying to, you know, keep it cool, keep it, you know. I remember my first day, my first day on set of Mega Time Squad. 
All right, here's me walking in. Yeah, woohoo! Proper first feature. Yeah, I got this. Holy shit, is that Johnny Bruff? Fuck. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to go out for a smoke now. <laughs> I had that same moment. And like right. when I went up to him, I'm like, uh, excuse me, uh, are you Johnny Bruff? He's like, yep. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> Awkward. See you lunch. See you lunch, Johnny. <laughs> But now, you know, if we catch up, it's just like us. Guns Kimbo, you worked with Jason Lee Howden, fantastic director. Wasn't your first time. Your first time, from what I've seen, was Deathgasm. Obviously, uh, you know, acting alongside the very beautiful and talented Kimberly Crossman. How did you land that role? What was it like on set? That role was, I'd come back from America after a very long stint in America with absolutely no work, feeling pretty bad about myself, working for $8 an hour in a cafe. Came back from America, and then that was one of the auditions that popped up. I seem to remember the first audition was, I feel like Jason was there at the audition, and I thought I had done a bad job, basically. I thought they would, they would be looking for uh, someone a bit heavier, a bit of a heavy, more heavy metaler. Uh, and to my surprise, I got a call back. Uh, yeah, must have been a few weeks later, I was advised I got the role. And it was a big, it was a big thing for me at that time because I hadn't really done any, any kind of New Zealand features with the back of the New Zealand NZ Film Commission. So yeah, I was, I was super, super stoked about it. I remember it being a sticky job. There was lots of fake blood. I think the special effects guy's name was Tim. I've got to hope, I'm so bad with names and I feel like such a bastard, but the special effects guy was amazing. Uh, but occasionally, like if he was just, because it was, it was a, a low budget rushed sometimes job. And so occasionally the special effects guy would be like, all right, we've got this, we've got this blood shot. And he'd powdered up with like a fire extinguisher to shoot compressed air. And basically he had like over-calculated how much power he needed. And so this blood shot went off and we we're shooting in a studio and it shot up over the walls of the studio. There's no ceiling and just absolutely sprayed the whole like camera gear and all the grips stuff. So all the lighting equipment, all the camera gear was just covered in blood, which then like we kept, we kept filming, we couldn't stop. And so at the end of the day, it had like crusted onto all this, all these componentry and all these bits and pieces. So they had to spend like the night scrubbing it off. So I remember a lot of that. I remember a lot of like, okay, we've got one more take, one more take. We've got to get this in this one. And being like, oh, man, I hope I get this. One of, the, one of the major scenes in that film where I have to kill my best friend because he's being overtaken by the demon. Spoiler alert, they, they had a safety razor. And they said, look, we've blunted this razor. Don't press down too hard. And I said, not a worry. I'm a professional. Okay, I've been doing this for years. And then it was like, okay, well, okay, now we actually need to, we don't have any time. We've got five minutes left in the day. And this is a big shot. And it was like, it was like a massive, big emotional scene for me. So I was like, okay, oh God, like pressure's on, like trying to act so hard, like trying to act, killing your best friend because there's a demon inside of it. It's hard thing to act. But I like cut. And he was like, dude, what the hell? I can feel it cutting my skin as you dragged it across. I was like, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. I won't have it again. I won't have it. Sorry, man. Sorry. And he's like, don't let that tell you. I won't. Next take same thing happened again they were like action and they were like really feel it really feel it and i was like yeah really feel it <laughs> thank god it was blunted like that is such a dangerous anyway he had a couple of lines he had a couple of like scratchy lines across his neck and he was he was none too not too happy about it but uh he lived to tell the tale so what was it actually like working with kimberly crossman i knew Kimberly a little bit from one of my girlfriends was a good friend of hers. And so we had been around each other a, li a very little bit. And I was like, oh yeah, I was like, Kim seems cool. But then on Deathgasm, I was like, Kim is again, one of the most generous people. She's very like able to share her <laughs> enthusiasm for things. She's in an, an incredible lift to a crew because she's always in such a good mood. So yeah, Kim was amazing. A true, true professional. She came back from LA to do the film on her own dime. She was just like, I'll, I'll be in New Zealand for it because she believed in the script and she believed in the story and Jason, and I know Jason was very thankful for that. You know those people who you're just like, there's no way you're not gonna make it because you always work so hard. That's Kim. She's she's always like, she's just grinding away at her, at her craft and it shows. Did you expect it to be so um, well received, so popular? Like I said at the start, I mean, people have been making pop vinyls on your character and whatnot. Did you expect it to, to blow up to the point that it has? Not at all. I often think in terms of the things that I've done, it's so strange. It's so strange to be a performer and people say, oh, what what have you done? And you can be have, have done it for 10 years. 
and you, people can ask you, what, what would I have seen you in? And you can say, um, nothing. Or, or people say, oh, what should I watch of your work? And you'd be like, oh, nothing, dude, don't watch it. It's all bad. Like you can do it for 10, 50. I've been doing it by that stage for since you know, I was 13, since I had an agent for 15 years. And there was nothing that I could point to and be like, I'm confident that you'll at least get a laugh out of this or you'll think this is interesting. It's kind of an amazing, strange place to be in. But I was really happy about Deathgasm, of course, really stoked for its success. And also it was great for me because I feel like I can point anybody to that film and be like, it's just a fun thing to watch. It doesn't drag its feet. It's over pretty quick. And it's a nice like New Zealand take on a heavy metal horror film and so yeah i i'm just been like god bless god bless jason house god bless jason lee howden and and his weird mind how old are you don't they need you downstairs no no i i like it up here hey where are you going? Fuck off. Oh. 2016, you did a tiny little film called Mega Time Squad. How did you get involved with that? What was, what was you know, the experience like? Again, the director, Tim Van Dam, and I had kind of seen around and about because one of my good friends, Anton Tennant, had worked with him a bit. And I had actually auditioned for a role on his musical Romeo and Juliet a couple of years before. And that something went down where he was like, oh, I'd, I'd love you to do this role. And then I was working, delivering flowers at the time. And I was like, I don't know if I can... They didn't want to give me the time off, so I basically couldn't do that role. And I don't know if Tim <laughs> remembers that. He might remember it differently. I was real gutted because I really liked Romeo and Juliet. And so he was auditioning for me, Time Squad. I was living at a place, this massive flat, and there was a production company in that flat, and they were the ones that produced that film. So I actually auditioned in the flat that I was living in, which was great close location to travel to did the audition again I was like oh I did an okay job but not nothing great and I think I only did one audition for that and then they're like yep kablamo it's yours if you want it and I was like hells yes and I was really happy because Anton was in it and I've always thought Anton was a really good actor and doesn't get enough recognition and so I was stoked that he was in it and then I don't think I knew Johnny Bruff was in it until later on I was super stoked about that because I was also a fan <sighs> did you find him he disappeared Right, fucking useless. I'm gonna fuck off home and you cunts better find him. And I had seen a lot of Tim's work and was a big believer in his work. That's the closest thing that I can think of like, of to my peers and people that I knew behind the scenes making the film. Like other films felt like, oh, there's like this, these professionals and they're like, da da da. But that one actually felt like a group of people who I could call like my friends and they were shooting this thing. And it was a pretty, pretty low budget joint. Yeah, I was, again, super happy with how, how it came out. I thought you were great in it. I mean, I think, I think the whole thing, people, people have mentioned Mega Time Squad a lot to me. And I think, you know, there's that weird kind of Pakeha class of people. In, <laughs> and that's, that's rude. But there's a type of Pakeha person that like lives in tents. Yeah. And, and it's a, well, the same with Whangarei. It's like kind of a, the kind of social group that I kind of grew up with and knew of. And I feel like maybe it was one of the first times that had been seen on screen. And so I think it was interesting for that reason. Yeah. Do you have a favorite scene? I love, <laughs> I love when there's multiple Antons breaking into the house and confusing everybody. That was real fun to play too. Uh, and any favorite behind the scenes moments? I remember our rap photos on the staircase. Oh yeah, that was in the <laughs> Grayland Bowling Club, eh? That was pretty yeah, sick. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. I really liked. We were out at like some weird abandoned ort, uh, like plant nursery. Do you remember that? Out west. It was like Hobsonville and there was like an abandoned plant nursery. But it was, you got, you and um, Jaya ran in and had like. He disappeared. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I like that day because it was just, that was very chill. It was quite a nice environment. I like, I like kind of, there was lots of graffiti around and uh, there was like a nice couch that you could just lay there. <laughs> yeah. That was my first day on set. Whoa. That's crazy. Yeah. That was, uh, I've done two features and Mega Time Squad is probably the biggest one that I've done. Whoa. I'm a Power Ranger. <laughs> Because that would have been such an experience that, you know, would have been probably left you a bit dumbfounded. So what was that experience like? That was amazing. It was a six month long shoot. We shot 32 episodes and you did three months before Christmas and then three months after 2008, 2009. I had just moved down to Auckland about six to seven months prior. I was delivering pizzas. So it was like this amazing role 
And I, one of the best days was ringing up and quitting that job as a pizza deliverer. I was 19, uh, so I was pretty pretty fresh. And it was uh, the first thing I had to do in an American accent. It was a pretty intoxicating time. It was a, it was a lot of cash, basically. And then there was a crew of people who you were hanging out with, which is, and a lot of them were Kiwis. There was a couple of Australians. We spent so much time with each other and we hung out with each other on the weekend. And it really felt like, I remember feeling like, this is insane. It felt like I had been delivering pizzas and then suddenly I was like the head of a bank or it felt like a really, it did feel insane. I remember the production like, we're, okay, we're getting, you guys are all going to dinner at this restaurant. I was like in the viaduct and like me, 19 years old, was like, wow, big city, like, woo. It really felt like insane. That like year, year and a half afterwards are some of the greatest memories I have just because I met my, I met my wife on there, Liv Tennant, who we were, we went out together for seven years, were married for two. Rose McIver was on that. Ika Darville, who's a really close friend of mine, is Australian. Dan Ewing, Adelaide Kane, Ari Boyland is another Kiwi. We're all real tight. And yeah, we just, we just had a great time. And I can also see why, like, you can hear how stupid I was and how big headed I was at 19, getting one role on a kid's TV show that aired at 8.30 a.m. in some states of America. Okay, imagine if you're Justin Bieber, or I when I, I remember when I was on that show and I was like, I can totally understand how Justin Bieber or any of those teen stars are just crazy drug addicts because the power goes to your head. And I even remember like at the start of that filming process, people would be like, do you want a cup of tea? And you're like, oh no, no thanks, I'll, I'll get it. I'll, no, don't, don't trouble yourself. No, do you want a chair? Like, no, no, I'll stand, I'll stand. And you get so used to that privilege and that money that by the end, I was like, where the hell is my tea? This is warm, you little twerp. I'm not drinking this, like chucking it in people's faces. Like, I want a chair now. And we'd be like, ugh. We became like a little bit bratty, I would, I would say. So yeah, it was an interesting, it was a really interesting experience and a taste of the life of, of a slightly successful actor which was really intoxicating for me at the age of 19. Also a real treasure to be a part of that franchise because I've been, I've, been I've been a fan as a child. So it was a little bit like, this is insane that I'm now the Green Power Ranger. It's insane. I don't know if you saw in lockdown, there was one of the talk show hosts got a whole bunch of Lord of the Rings cast together to have a video reunion special. I don't know if you saw that. What would be the chances of getting you, Ari, Mike and Dan together to do something similar? I'm up for it. <laughs> You think they would be? That's a good question. I don't know. I know Dan is in Australia. He's a very busy lad. He's a very busy lad with lots of big muscles. Yeah, you'd have to ask him. I mean, I'd love to, but you'd have to ask him. Or, or, or maybe I could leave it to you and you could ask your fellow castmates. Yeah, I'll send him now. There would obviously be a lot of fans that would absolutely love to see that. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking... Damn, how wasted was I last night? I don't even remember recording this. <laughs> so, Blood Punch. What would a typical day on set be like for Blood Punch? You wake up in a log cabin. Literally, you wake up in a log cabin in uh, the mountains near Hemet, California. There's snow on the, on the uh, roof. You can smell eggs and bacon that have been... You, it's the same smell that you've been smelling for the past two weeks because the catering person made eggs and bacon in the house every morning and then dump the lard from the bacon that they would bake outside. So there was this, by the end, there was this mound of wax-like bacon fat, which was really disgusting. You put your costume on, which is already crispy with old fake blood. And then the director says, this is the scene where we're gonna shoot you. Put some, you put some like under armor, kind of like padded, you put like a padded vest on. Okay, there's a great outtake. Oh, this is Ari Boyland who played one of the leads in this film and they were, they were shooting him and it, the director was like, I'm just going to shoot you with like paintball, like dust pellets. So it looks like gunshots, but they're really just dust pellets. And he's like, it's only going to hurt if it hits bare skin. You've got like the vest on, you've got something underneath the vest, you've got side armor on and he's going to be like a couple meters away just behind the camera, no big deal. So Ari was like, yeah, yeah all good, all good, all good. And he was just like, just sell each shot. Like, yeah, yeah. And you can see on the outtake, <laughs> every time it makes me laugh because you can see this there's, there's like one there's like it's like one there and i was like ah oh, and like selling it ah oh, oh like selling it and then one the director just it, the, the bullet like there's a bit of window it just curves off and it just hits 
like the sensitive piece of skin like right there and those things i don't know they're going like 100 kilometers an hour or something and so you can see the difference when ari's like ow ow and he goes ow, ow, ow. <laughs> and it kicks him in the arm and that was a, that was a highlight for me but there's lots of amazing locations out in the desert at an airstrip in the desert and basically again lots of fake blood lots of fake guns and uh lots of fake methamphetamine i'm helpful boy and uh, oh, <laughs> i'm helpful boy and uh, as you know my hero the baton is in quarantine because of the virus mm -hmm. um and so just looking for a replacement hero just for a short short term during lockdown last year you became a superhero you interviewed people to become you know part of your team how did that, that come about just before we were going into lockdown my girlfriend pulls me aside and she says we're going to make a web series because we've been talking about making something together. We've been like, be great, isn't it? She's like, we're going to make a web series. It's going to be a sidekick searches for a new hero and it's going to be all done over Zoom. So it was literally everything was her idea. I was like, that's brilliant. She was just like, we can make it fast. And so like literally we, we, we locked down with her parents in Wanganui and literally the next day we were like calling up people being like, here's the series idea. Here's your character idea. It's an improvised thing. Let's go. What do you have? And so me and Ella would riff on ideas and I funny, funny things we thought for characters, then we would send that out to actors. And the amazing thing was everyone was in lockdown, first lockdown, no one knew what to do. So they would get a message from us and I'd be like, well, I'm not doing anything else. And so we got these amazing people. We got Kuda Forrester, we got Johnny Braff. We were just pinching ourselves of how lucky we were. And I really love improv. I'm, I'm not very experienced in improv, but I really want to do more. So it was a real joy for me. And Ella was kind of directing. Yeah, that was a, that was a real joy. It was a lot of work because it was just us two writing, filming, editing, and sending out invites to people. So it was a lot of work, but it was really, really fun. So your first acting stint that I saw uh, when I did some research on you uh, was Pet Detectives. So how did that how did that happen? I mean, being your first role when you've been talking about, you know, doing similar type of stuff at school, very low key. How did that all sort of come into fruition? There was one before that called Secret Agent Man. Very similar vibe. Young, the Secret Agent Man was young secret agents. Pet Detectives was young paranormal agents, I guess. I was playing a nerd. Pet Detectives stood for Paranormal Extraterrestrial Time Travel Detectives. We were like basically the fabulous five, but we dealt with the science fiction world i remember that being a really good job i lived in auckland it was super fun dominic ona ariki who's now on one lane bridge and he's an absolute gangster he's a very talented man and that was one of his first roles i think it was a pleasure acting with him i just remember a lot of that was just like it was just super it was super super fun i don't have a lot of memories from that because it was so long ago <laughs> We spoke about celebrity crushes earlier, didn't we? My New Zealand celebrity crush has been in a couple of fantastic, well-known TV shows. First one was Once Upon a Time. The next one was I Zombie. Who am I talking about? Rose McIver. Fantastic actress. She is very beautiful. I actually have her autograph on two pop vinyls from I Zombie. Church chair, thanks to Daffodils. What was it like working with such a talented actress on Madigan's Quest? It was great. I didn't see much of her in Madigan because she was all doing all, I'm the lead of the show, I'm all, I'm all this, I'm giving it all this. So I didn't see her much on Madigan's Quest. Madigan's Quest was fun. I first met Rose, coincidentally, on Pet Detectives, where she played someone who had time traveled forwards from like the 1600s. And we got on very well. And I was like, Rose McCarthy, oh, bloody nice lady. And then on Madigan's Quest, I was like, hey i remember you she was like hey i remember you but i was only on madigan's quest for like two days or something so i was just like "Ooh, hello Ooh. and we really uh got to hang out on power rangers um that was where we had the most stuff together rose i mean you know she's a delightful funny intelligent smart caring person who is also extremely talented and works on her craft Rose, untrained, much like you and I, sir. We share a lot of similarities with Rose McIver. Untrained, Rose McIver, and I think her first role was on The Piano when she was four. Rose got a really uh, lovely, down-to-earth personality, and she very much cares about keeping communication up with her old friends. Like, when I knew her, she was, she was still, like, actively engaging with a lot of her friends from high school. Like, she's not someone who drops 
people and then like never talks to them again. He's a really lovely, lovely person. So you're still in contact? Occasionally, yeah. We'll message each other on Instagram and, and hang out. I just saw recently that another series has been picked up, like a CBS series, which is amazing. She's kind of in that zone now where things are starting to snowball and it's getting, it looks like an exciting career for her, which is bloody great. Couldn't have happened to a nicer I saw there were a couple of mentions that you were nominated for Best Actoire. How did that feel? It's always nice to be nominated. I have only won one award. It was for a festival in Spain that I didn't attend. I believe it's called the Terra Molins Festival. I'm not sure where it is in Spain. And the winner for Best Film is Deathgasm. Deathgasm. I got an acting award there and literally it was like I'd won the Oscar. I was like, oh, oh my God. I sent a, I sent an acceptance video. <laughs> it's probably some like dude in his garage hosting this film festival. I'd like, I don't know how big it is. I had never heard of it before, but it's so gratifying to be nominated or to win any award. And it's also so meaningless, really, because how can you say that this actor is better than that actor or this film is better than that film? I, I always find it like, it's crazy how we buy, but every year, like the Oscars are like, oh, come on. I buy into it every year. Like, ah. Amy Poehler in her book writes about the Oscars specifically. She's like, it's like, uh, we're having dinner and people are like, do you want dessert? And you're like, no, no, no. And then suddenly the dessert comes out and you're sitting around and other people have dessert. And you're like, I want dessert. I want a dessert. She says, that's like when you're not, you're like really, it's not until like other, on the night that you're like, give me it. I want, I want. It. Oh shit. Dude, hey, you scared the crap out of me. Some of these guys are too carried away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you the ante? No. Hey, session? No. Okay, well, let me know if you change your mind because my auntie grows in Montuweka. Of course, the one other show that uh, film that we haven't talked about, of course, was a fantastically done remake. It involved uh, a, a mini or a BMW. What was it? It, it was a vehicle of some sort that traveled the, the, the length of the country uh, and it was called Pork Pie. And uh, if I remember rightly, you played some sort of crazy kind of twisted person at the party. You do remember that correctly. Uh, imagine if it had been a VW Beetle. They, they, we, we should remake it with a VW Beetle. I played a, a man at a party who was wearing a Hannibal Lecter mask, and I really wanted to smoke weed with one of the main characters. And he wasn't that interested, but I was. And I had some weed that my auntie had grown. I can't remember where it was. I feel like the weed had a name, but I can't remember what, I can't remember what it was. That was like a, a one-day roll. I think they, they, I want to say they flew me down to Wellington, but I don't know if that's true or not. But it was shot around like Lower Hutt or something. It was in this big warehouse that was empty and it was cold and they had people pretending to party in there. And I just remember it was a night shoot and everyone was a bit over it. <laughs> I'm a huge Philly fan. And of course, I loved them in Almighty Johnson's. But yeah, tell me just briefly, what's it like working with Dino Gorman? He's a cheeky wee lad. Nah, Dino Gorman's seriously seriously nice dude he's also a really gifted photographer and that's like his second passion dino gorman is so is such a relaxed actor like during rehearsals they're like they'll like rehearse a scene before we do it uh, me because i'm nervous i'll be like okay i'm gonna give it my all like i'm gonna give it like 90 percent of my performance <laughs> no don't take me away and dino gorman is so chill he's just been doing it for so long and he's so relaxed he's like in the rehearsal he's like no don't take me away and then I'm like, oh, it's, it's looking a bit, whew, that performance is looking a bit dead. Uh, and then they'll roll and he's just amazing, just like boom, off the mark. Yeah, that was something I, was, I noticed about him. I was like, it feels so effortless to him. And he's so natural and relaxed on set. And yeah, he's another one who's just like, it feels when you're with Dino, it feels like you're hanging out with like a cool kid from high school except he's like being nice to you, unlike the cool kids at my high school. We've just spoken about a whole bunch of projects that you've been involved with. You've got pr uh, you know, a pretty impressive looking resume. Out of all the characters that you've played right from being young to today, who's been your favorite and why? 
the characters that I've had most fun with are the ones where I can feel I can be the most free and I don't have to be like the straight guy. So I always love when I, when I get the funny line, basically. I love that. I'd, so probably it would be this character on, on this web series that I've just done because he was, was out, kind of outrageous and was always trying to get a rise from people, was always trying to piss people off. So he just wore, he wears like super short shorts, weird 70s singlets, and he's just kind of a, an, an enigma. What is your biggest and most weirdest fear? I do not like the dark. Like if I have to go to the toilet at night, like I want, I want spotlights on. I don't want this creeping around in the dark because if I flush the toilet and then I'm walking down a long hallway and there's no, I don't like it. I I, uh, I prefer mostly to be in well-lit areas. If you could have a mundane superpower, what would it be? The ability to peel any fruit perfectly. So just imagine a perfectly peeled watermelon. You just got this bowl, this like dome of watermelon with no skin that you can just eat. What would be your theme song for your life? Go, go, Power Ranger. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Uh, which fictional character would you love to meet in real life? Damn, that's a good question. I would love... That is a friggin' head scratcher, man. Uh, let's go with... I'm trying to think of someone who would be like, man, that dude's so cool and interesting. And all I can think of is Ryan Gosling. <laughs> What's his most interesting role? Blue Valentine. His role from Blue Valentine. Oh, no, that was... No, no. No, I got no. I have literally no answer to that. What is the worst purchase you have ever made? I, when I was on Power Rangers and had more money than cents, I bought a. Okay, yeah, this is the worst purchase I've ever made. Uh, there was a, a Quentin Tarantino themed party, and I said, "I'm going to go as the Gimp." And what does every Gimp need? But a three hundred and fifty dollar leather Gimp mask from uh, like a sex store that I stumbled into. And it's real leather. The zips are beautiful quality. And I literally put it on, went to the party, and people were like, hey, who's that? And I was like, it's Milo. And they're like, oh, hey, cool, man. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I should have to have $50. I literally wore it for one night. And since then, have only worn it every night since. No, since then, it's really not been used. <laughs> but it is an incredible, like, in, in many ways, it was the worst purchase, and in many ways, it was an incredible purchase because I don't know anybody else with a gift mask. It's like, and you can put it on, and it's just immediately like, what the hell? It, it, it's crazy how it transforms a person. Like, you can just be looking at a person, and they put it on, and you're like, oh, it's like freaky and scary and weird, and there's little pinholes for your eyes. I, I can highly recommend it. <laughs> Talking about that, what's a body part that you wouldn't mind losing? Okay. I could do without, I think I could do pretty well without my like left foot, if not left leg. You still hop around, I suppose. Hey, you'd be able to play a paraplegic. So it's Open not like you're acting to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, favorite person that you've worked with? It's probably going to be Daniel Radcliffe because I was such a fan and because he was so nice to me without needing to be. And you wouldn't expect that from someone, you know, with that kind of background. Yeah, credentials, you know. Uh, I'd sort of expect them to be like, yes, I'm Harry Potter. You know, mm-hmm, kind of thing. But it d- doesn't even sound like that. And that's one thing that's been really shining through this interview is the fact, you know, we've spoken a lot about, a, you know, Kiwi actors and stuff and how they're so chill. And, you know, they're so, you know, having that nice chat, unless you're young Rose McIver who thinks you steal the show, putting that aside, you know, it's always just laid back. Then you flip it over to the other side and you look at most other countries, especially big film countries like America. They're like, I'm an actor. Step away from me. I don't need you, you know. And that's where we definitely differentiate is we are more open. And who would you like to work with? I'd love to do a film with Taika Waititi. Love to do a film with Michelle Gondry. I could play Timothy Chalamet's older, more beaten up uncle or cousin. <laughs> Just like people could say, I could easily play Jack Black's brother. So I know I get That's that. That's exactly it. I get that. Well, That's that. It. That concludes our interview. Thank you very much, Milo. I mean, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. It's been co- almost like a catch up. But at the same time, I'm interrogating you. It's great. <laughs> right. It's a very friendly interrogation. I appreciate it. 
And you, the fans, if you do want to see another interview with Milo and have some questions for him, be sure to uh, hashtag interview Milo. Uh, and we will try and organize a second part. We are both very busy individuals and I am very thankful for your time. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add? Any sort of social networks that are fans of yours can come and check you out and see what's going on with Milo? No, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I appreciate all the, all the time that went into crafting these questions and the time that you could sit down here with me and, and also for being so gracious with my lateness. It's been a bloody pleasure, mate. Until we meet again, thank you, my dear brother.